The session tonight is going to go for about 30 to 40 minutes. Uh, it's very informal though, so please just ask me a bunch of questions. Um, as we said in the invite, we're going to take you through customer journey mapping, uh, our perspective on that, how you guys can adopt some of that in what you do in your day-to-day -day work. Um, and hopefully it'll be pretty relaxed. All right, I'll just give you a brief overview of who we are. And so my name's Tom. I'm one of the co-founders of uh, Cooperate. We're a marketing platform for large companies. Um, these are some of the people we work with. Uh, we help people map customer journeys to marketing activity uh, to business results um, around content and marketing, con marketing content and campaigns. Uh, hence, Cooperate, you know, so content operations. Um, in terms of you know, who I am, my background, so I uh, used to work client side in marketing for Foster's Group for many years and then I worked agency side for uh, about five years as well in media strategy and things like that. Um, a bit of a stint at Melbourne University in strategy uh, and then I founded this company with my co-founders here up the back about five years ago. The goals for, for tonight, hopefully you guys get, can get this out of, out of the session. So the first up is I just want to take you through the, the reasons for building out a customer journey. Like, there's really clear reasons why we think and we believe this is really valuable for marketers. Um, I'm going to take you through what we think cus good customer journeys... Sorry, I'll stop moving that around. What good customer journeys actually are. Most importantly, I want to give you a repeatable framework you guys can use, so you can take it away from tonight and actually execute it and implement it in your, um, in your jobs. And an actionable framework is the key part. So, Whatever we whenever we talk about customer journeys, it's always something that you can action. It's like an action-oriented tool you can use. Just talking a little bit more about what we do. So customer journeys for us, for us always come at the start of a marketing process. So marketers generally, they're stuck in what we call the messy middle. The chaotic, annoying part about every, all of our jobs, right? It always looks and feels like that because you're running multiple campaigns, you're doing multiple things, you're getting stretched in different directions. Um, our thesis and the reason why we do what we do, the reason why we founded this company is because we believe... I'm going to give up on that. We believe, basically, that to get a bit of clarity and to get a bit of um, balance within that chaos and what we call the mess messy middle, you need to top and tail it with great customer journeys tied to um, performance benchmarking. And then whatever you do in the messy middle um, has cl greater clarity, has greater meaning. So you can really tie what you're actually doing to a great strategy and measure the results. So that's what we do. Um, tonight we're just going to go over the start, what we call the start, but there's a whole bunch of stuff that comes after that. All right, everything that I covered tonight is from a workbook that we have uh, that you can, you'll all get, we'll um, send it to you, so don't, you can write that down, but we'll send it to you after if you, if you registered on Eventbrite. And everything I go through tonight is mapped to activities and sort of um, workshop notes that you guys can take away and run with your own teams. We also do that for our clients, so you can, and anyone who will basically uh, be interested in having us come on site, we actually run those workshops for you as well. Um, so don't worry too much about taking extensive notes. Um, they'll all be in that workbook you can download. All right, I'm just going to quickly go about what we think customer journeys are. Customer journeys and customer journey mapping is not customer experience mapping. They are very similar, but slightly different. The primary difference for us is that customer journey mapping is marketing and sales focused. So if you're a marketer or a salesperson or someone who looks after that broad area in a business, a customer journey map should give you actionable insights into what to do next. It does relate to customer experience. You know, a great customer experience map might be, for an airline, might be the way that you get greeted when you go onto the plane all the way through to what your um, frequent flyer email experience looks like, right? But for a marketer, you sort of need to go above that and you don't have to get into every single detail, but you need to have actionable kind of insights that are built into your customer journey map. So that's how we define the difference. I just want to take you through why. So why do we do this? Um, the first reason is basically just to visualize value. 
So at a bare minimum, a customer journey map should be basically a representation of the value that you deliver to a customer over time. It's as simple as that. If you're interested in more in this, the best book for you to get is Mapping Experiences, that one up there by O'Reilly. Um, you don't have to, it's basically as simple as that in my opinion. So that's the first reason. But, but, I have also been on the receiving end of a customer journey map that sort of looks like this, from you know, my UX colleagues when I was working in digital agencies and, and other people, business designers, things like that. They're great, they are great, but that's like at the end of a big process, right? They go through a massive process and they give you this great thing that looks great on a poster. But I can't do anything with it. So a great customer journey map should give you action orientation. And when I say action orientation, it should be the iteration point for what you do in marketing, for what you do in sales, for the content you create, which is very challenging to do from a PowerPoint slide. So a great customer journey map should do that. Should do that for you. That's why we call it the start. In terms of defining it for us, basically it's just a sequence that a customer goes through as they become or remain a customer with you, with one or more brands. The other reason why we do this is we think some ideas are really timeless in marketing, and the basis for our customer journey work is based on three what we call plank, we think are plank marketing concepts that basically don't change. The first one is this quote. Have you guys heard this quote before? It's classic. Everyone's nodding their heads. So this was said by a guy called John Wanamaker. He was a retailer, quite a big philanthropist. It wasn't exactly, sh well, I'm not exactly sure when he said it, but it was sometime between 1838 and 1922. I think pri you know, prior to 1900, so, uh, prior to the turn of that century. Um, he founded a, a lot of the retail chain stores that became Macy's in America, so he's a you know, really innovative guy. But the insight was basically marketing works, but we're not sure which part. The crazy thing is this is still true for us, right? This is still true, and that was like 150, almost 150 years ago. So that's the first key plank, basically. We're trying to break, break that apart using customer journeys. The next timeless idea that we base it on is this one. The marketing funnel, which I'm sure you've all heard of, which is also 100 years old, more than 100 years old. The really simple insight is that you can't get everything done in one hit. You can't move people through a process in one hit. As much as people think we can, or you keep stuffing co creative concepts into the same creative idea, you can't get everything done at once. And he came up with this over a period of about 15 years, uh, between 1895 and 1910. Uh, weirdly, he was also from the same town as the previous man, John Wanamaker, Philadelphia in the US. And he was an original ad exec. He founded an ad agency back then. But the funnel is real, right? And we can't get away from it. The next timeless idea is something that we really believe in. It's a bit, wind the clock forward about 80 years. And this guy, Clay Christensen, he wrote a great book called uh, The Innovator's Dilemma. His framework, the jobs to be done framework, is, is another reason why we think customer journey mapping is so important. He said, people hire you to get a job done. And they're hiring you to get a job done at a different stage in their relationship with your brand. So a great customer journey should be a reflection of that. Um, you're in the business of delivering on people's needs. So you need to design your marketing for the job to be done at each of those stages. If you're interested in that, there's not enough time to go in through it tonight. It's really fascinating. He, um, he's an academic for the Harvard Business Review and there's a range of great articles and videos and things on that. So it's these three powerful ideas that should come together within your customer journey. Identify what is working in your marketing and sales. Define the stages of relationship that you have with your customer um, and the job that your marketing needs to do at that point. And if you do that really well, then you'll, you have a lot more strength as a marketer in, the, in what you have to do when you go to work every day. So a great customer journey should do these things. It should give you that framework to evaluate your marketing and say what is working and what isn't working for this reason. That's what it should give you. Um, it should also empower you and your team. Um, you should be empowered to do 
great work or not do something if you have a great foundation in a customer journey map. That's what we believe. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that when we get to that point around creative and ideas. It should also inspire you to do great marketing. It should give you that inspiration to know what to do and when. Calm down the conversation, hopefully, around certain initiatives that you might be running to make people focus on what really matters at that point in the customer journey for that piece of content or for that campaign or whatever it is. Um, and it should be a, be, a, be a point of action, as I said before. All right, so that's why. That's why we do what we do. So what are the steps? Basically, this is the process that we take our clients through when we run these workshops. First, you need to define the stages and the need state for your customers. Then for each of those, the business objectives and the customer action you're optimizing for. Then you should be debating and negotiating between your team, between people, other stakeholders, the channels that you're using, and the content that you're delivering. And that's diagnostically the process you should go through. It shouldn't be, let's do this great campaign or let's do this piece of creative outside of that framework. Then we have a measurement uh, process that, we can, or that I'll go through tonight, so how, how you should be measuring those things. Um, and then briefly at the end, I'm going to talk about iteration. So using this framework as an iteration template to optimize and better improve your marketing. At the end, you get something that looks like this, very pretty, um, that maps all of the different stages that you have to a customer journey, uh, a customer journey map, sorry, that maps all the stages you have to a brand, segments or personas that you're targeting, uh, products that, you, that align with that customer journey, key metrics that matter at each of those phases, and then campaigns and content that aligns with those stages. So that's, that's the goal, that's what you want. It doesn't have to look like that, it can be on a whiteboard. As long as you're writing it down, that's a, that's a massive first step. So let's talk about defining your stages in a great customer journey. Through the presentation, I'll just I'll use this example. This is, we have quite a few healthcare uh, clients, but obviously because we have NDAs with all our clients, I can't tell you exactly what they do, but I'm going to paraphrase for a startup called Nectar Vitamins um, that doesn't exist. Nectar Vitamins is a subscription vitamin brand. Um, if anybody wants to start this, I'd love to subscribe to it. It's tailored based on a questionnaire that you fill out when you sign up. So you fill out a questionnaire and you say, look, I've got mild anxiety and stress because um, I've got 10,000 children and a really hard job, whatever it is. Uh, and then my back hurts a little bit. And also, you know, I feel lethargic. And from that, we deliver a great set of tailored vitamins to you. So that's the business proposition. So if I was going to make a customer journey for this brand, um, for me, say as a almost middle-aged man, I would say, I would try and articulate it as a story first. So try and write a story about that customer as they become a, uh, that person as they become a customer with you. So the first uh, part of that story for this brand would be, um, all right, when, when someone's just finding out about Nectar Vitamins, I, I know that the way that they're feeling is that they're sort of, their health isn't in a great place, uh, and they're looking for solutions, but they're not really sure. They're, they're sort of in the dark. I need them to respect the category of tailored vitamins, which I'm in, which is basically, you know, something that's tailored for you. That's what I need them to do at the first stage of relationship. And then I need them to take an action, which is basically to Google the concept of tailored vitamins. The next step might be intent, intent to buy. At that stage, I know that they've Googled tailored vitamins. What I need them to do is, um, uh, and the need state that I think that they're in, um, is they're evaluating tailored vitamins versus just going to the supermarket and buying some. And I know tailored vitamins are more expensive. I need them to uh, believe that I have the best interest in the, of them and their health at heart when they purchase from me and spend more on my vitamins. And the action I want them to take when they're feeling like that is to fill out my custom questionnaire on my website. So those are two stages I just talked you through in a story. What it actually looks like in a customer journey is this. Remember, we're trying to build up those columns in a customer journey, right? So this stage is awareness. 
their customer needs is, is they're confused about managing their overall health and they're lost. They're looking for a solution. They're a bit lost. And I know that they're looking to hire, using the jobs to be done framework, they're looking to hire something to fix their health problem. But hiring at that point could be a chiropractor. It could be talking to their mate about what they do and just going to the supermarket and buying some Swiss, whatever it is. As I said, the business objective is to respect that tailored vitamins and the action is, the, is to just Google, just the branded, uh, is the category search, the Google category search. The idea is that you do that for every single phase. Now the great thing about doing this as a team is you in instantly, and I've seen it so many times as my, as my colleagues have, you instantly recognise that not everyone in your team thinks the same way about the customer journey. Is it, it happens every time. Every time we sit down with a team of marketers, they're like, no, this, this isn't how people buy, this is how they buy, right? And if that's the case, then great, that's actually a good thing. If, that all, if that's all your customer journey mapping process achieves, then that's a great outcome for you, because you can get alignment. At each, each step, I'll just give you a few tips when you're running your workshops or when you're trying to discuss this with your team or doing it yourself. The first thing is, if you can cut a stage, cut it out. Like the reason why a stage is there is it defines an, an emotional relationship or some sort of staged relationship with you. Um, I've seen customer journeys that go to like 12. It's not actual, it's not functional. Probably maximum. If you're a consumer brand, I'd say if you can make it three, great. If you're a B2B company, it's a bit more complicated. You might have six. That's a good benchmark. You should be defining a stage by one of these things, and it, and it does change. Depending on the stage that they're in, they're going through, it does change. It should be a state of relationship with a brand, or it could be a consensus state that you're trying to get people to. I know there's a few B2B customers in the, uh, people in the room. Sometimes all you're trying to get to is people to a consensus agreement on something. That could be a stage definition. Um, or it's a decision point. It could be an in-store decision point, a path to purchase decision point, whatever it is. Um, as I said, if you're deliberating or if you're disagreeing, you have an assumption that you go and then need to go and validate. If you've got a research team, great, go and validate it. Um, if not, just go and spend some time with some customers, you'll probably figure it out pretty quickly. Uh, and my preference is if you can make it actionable. So the state, the way, the way that this, the, each stage is defined should be some sort of actionable uh, definition. So those are the stages. The next thing is defining the need state. So to give you a sense of what the need state is, I might just tell you a story about when I was working in the wine industry. I really miss working in the wine industry, but um, my liver doesn't. It was a great, great time. Um, we, we had this NPD we were releasing, a new product, and it was targeted at young women. And the idea behind it was sort of like a spritz uh, sparkling wine. It was halfway between a spirit and a sparkling wine and an RTD. So it was a really weird mashup kind of NPD, right? Um, the category sort of existed, but sort of didn't exist. Um, so we were trying to think about, all right, how does this fit into these young women's lives? In terms of a need state, the job that they were hiring that brand to do um, for us was really fascinating when we actually started talking to these young women about it. At the stage when they were just getting exposed to the category, the job that actually they were hiring us to do wasn't like this is a Prosecco from Europe that is, you know, has low calorie or whatever it was. It wasn't anything to do with that. The thing that they were hiring that to do was to mark the transition from being like girls, basically who drink RTDs, to women, to young women. It was a status thing. Because wine really is actually, in a lot of cases, is this. It's not the Cabernet that comes from the crazy place. It's like the thing that makes me look good in social situations or it's the thing that marks the occasion. At the first stage in the relationship, that's what it was doing in that awareness phase. At the next phase for that specific NPD, we noticed when we, when we went and spent a bit of time with these girls, we just went out, went out to dinner basically. It was great. And there was a specific moment in the evening that marked, when they were out with their friends, that marked drinking wine at the dinner table and going out to a club and basically getting smashed. Some of them, and not all of them, most of them drank responsibly. That was a transition moment, right? From something harder to so so something softer, which was white wine, into something harder. And so 
the action orientation in the, in the purchasing funnel in that need state was not, um, this is light and refreshing, it was marking the transition in the journey over the evening. That was the occasion that we were marking, the job to be done. They wanted to hire us to mark the transition from the dinner table to the nightclub. So when you're thinking about need state, that's what I'd recommend. All right, I'm going to transition back to this. And hopefully it works out. So in my example here, my customer need state, I'm confused about managing my overall health and I need something concrete to hold on to because I'm not sure. That's the kind of customer that I'm targeting. That's the need state, the job that they're hiring me as a brand to do. In this context, they're hiring me um, not because I'm delivering you know, Panax ginseng from China. It's because they want to know that they're taking control of their health. They need that. So that's how you should define the customer need. So some tips, interrogate the real job to be done and just do that by spending time with customers. Um, if you're interested in learning more about that, there's a great guy called um, Steve Blank and the thesis of customer development. I'd recommend checking that out. Think about that need as it changes through the journey, right? We, we usually think about this in the context of the overall product proposition. But think about how that can change from the states uh, that they're in. So my need state, my job to be done need state for, say, a loyal airline customer is very different to someone who's, you know, maybe uh, mid-level engagement halfway down the funnel. And then you should iterate your brand message around the job to be done at each stage in the, in the customer journey. Business objectives. Now here's a robot playing a piano. I put this up here because um, a lot of the trend within marketing is to sort of uh, hand over the right to make decisions and influence customers. It's seemingly to things like AI algorithms and um, you know, audience of one kind of optimization journeys, those sorts of things. I'm not of the opinion that that's the way great marketing is done. I think great marketing is done in PowerPoint, not Excel. Marketing is a creative effort, it's a creative exercise. Um, and you're always trying to optimize for a behavior change, right? So we should never act, uh, leave those sort of choices and those decisions and the business objective that you want to achieve um, over to someone else. You shouldn't be told that you should be um, doing something else at that stage. And that's why in my example here for my vitamins, um, and I've seen this play out with other, with other um, brands. My objective is to get them to respect what I do in this case. And I'm going to go and change their behavior to make them respect my category, what I do in that stage. Um, a pro tip for this stage, for the business objectives, um, try and balance out sales and marketing because sales will always come in. Um, and try and dominate. Use the language of your CEO or CMO, if you can, in, that, in those points, because um, it's more likely they'll be hanging onto those components of the customer journey map. Um, and don't be afraid to strip it back. You shouldn't try and do too much at one stage. You should let go of things at, say, the awareness phase, or the intent phase, or whatever your phases are. You might have six, you might have 10, you might have one, two. Let things go. Don't try and pack everything into that stage. The business objective should be defined. So key actions. This is actually really simple. Once you get to this point, when we run these workshops, we generally find once we get here, everything else is so much easier. A key action at, every stage, at each stage is simply the behavior change you're trying to seek with one key distinction. You should try and phase it in terms of what a person does. That's just handy because it gives um, a more human feel to what you're doing in the strategy. Um, but it should also indicate that that's the behavior that moves someone from the, that stage to the next in the customer journey. So if that person is doing that, I can reasonably predict that they're moving into the next phase of relationship with me. So if you think back to my example, my vitamins example, or I'll go forward and show you. Um, my key action at that stage was simply Google the category, the category I'm trying to create, tailored vitamins. And that's it. And let's talk about content and channels. All right, so the best thing I like about this is once you get to this 
Once you get to this point, I do apologize about this, I know it's annoying. Um, once you get to this point, the conversations become easier. The other thing is once you get a defined customer journey, it becomes very easy for you to say, you know, someone comes up with this crazy wacky idea and it's very easy for you to say no, which is generally quite hard. One of my clients, UNSW, um, University, uh, a lot of our time spent with them was actually trying to figure out how to get them to be able to say no when, they, when content or advertising or marketing requests came in. And this is one of the mechanisms. So to give you an example, um, I'm at Nectar Vitamins and my CEO comes in and he says, or she says, uh, I want to hand draw the, the most beautiful and healthy people from all of history on little cards and I want to deliver every single one of them from, via drones to my customers. Great idea. I, I'm like, yep, love, I'd love to do that for you. But, you know, is that channel really the best, the best one to deliver that at that phase in the customer journey? Also, my CEO, where does that fit in my customer journey, right? As soon as you have those things, it becomes very, very easy. It also identifies clear gaps. I know that's a, uh, that's a stupid example, but in a more concrete example, we were running a workshop for a very, very large FMCG brand. They spent a lot of money in TV. They thought they had the whole thing nailed. We got to the middle of the funnel and we identified a huge gap in investment around path to purchase. Basically, they weren't helping their customers take their brand and their benefits from uh, higher level content in store. And in store, there are lots of things that can get in their way because the stores aren't well laid out. They're trying to search by um, problem definition. They were a healthcare company, but actually the um, uh, sorry, they were searching by problem definition, but the stores were laid out by brand, or sometimes totally randomly. And they weren't doing anything in that phase. But the thing that highlighted it was the customer journey map and that process. It also becomes very good to audit your content through this filter, um, which is another classic example. Um, so in the context of my drone delivered great sketches of healthy people, I can say, well, yeah, that sounds like a great idea, but out of the awareness phase, what I really want is just to build some category definition, right? Because I'm optimizing for a Google search. So maybe there are better channels and things we can use for that, my CEO. That's the purpose of getting to that point and defining the channel mix and the content mix at that point. Usually marketers start the other way around, or your agency comes to you with this great idea because they've got this discount with one of their partners. You should always put those things through the filter of your customer journey. Don't, don't just accept the standard channel mix that comes to you every year, because that's what we do. When you get to this point, really interrogate the channels you're using. Particularly in the context of the job that needs to be done by that content at that stage in the journey and the channel that you're delivering it through. Um, in general, challenge the way that your agency thinks on these sorts of things, if you have an agency, um, and try and inculcate them into this this filter and this frame. And as I said, filter all your ideas through this framework when they come out of the woodwork. You won't always win that battle, but hopefully you will most of the time. All right, the metrics. So once you've gone through that whole process and you've got your, you've got your sections, it's now time to think about how you measure. When we're with our clients, we try and recommend. So we have, uh, sorry, to back up a bit, we have uh, an analytics suite that can measure an amazing amount of things, like it's actually incredible. But part of me actually hates that, because people get lost in they're like, oh, we can measure this thing, we can measure that thing, and it's going to be great, and I can get it on my phone, and it'll give me an alert, it's so amazing. But basically, I try to say, look, there's probably just one metric at each phase in the journey that you need to optimize for, and if you just r maniacally care about that one metric, then you'll probably be okay. It's hard to hear sometimes. It's easier for some businesses. So for example, if you're B2B, it's a lot easier to say, all right, uh, new leads at the um, SQL stage is all I care about. And that's sort of fair enough, right? SQL, sales qualified lead. Um, consumer brands, is, it can be harder. The goal when you're looking at that for that one metric and the many supporting metrics is basically to decide which is which. Now the process we go through 
is we generally just try and get every single person who's in the workshop to throw up every single metric that they think is important for every single phase. Um, and then it's a really simple exercise. You just get them to vote. And, say, and eventually, they'll just cut themselves down if you just get them to debate it out for long enough. And so actually, yeah, branded search is the main thing that I care about as an e-commerce retailer in this category or whatever it is. Um, it is OK to track a metric plus the growth and decline of that. That's fine. Um, if you've got a business intelligence or an insights team, just give this problem to them, and they'll probably just take it all off your hands, as long as you can just brief the whole customer journey into them. To give you an example, say this is the customer journey for Uber. This is, I, did a, I did a workshop for another client of mine um, that now works in finance, and he was actually part of building this. And when I presented it to him, he said, yeah, a little bit off, but almost. So it's all right. So it's not, it's not their actual customer journey. But this gives you an understanding of the role that that plays. If I am at the aware phase, so building, building awareness, and awareness and that's a, for a saturated brand is probably just spontaneous awareness, then my key metric there is net new rides. Everything that I do in that phase is I'm searching for net new rides as a metric. If I optimize all of my people and all of my content and all of my channels into that, key met that one metric to achieve my key action, then I should be OK. And on and on it goes through the phases. Um, I started my career, uh, worked in Insights for a while. And I know it's not always possible to optimize for behavioral metrics at every stage. Behavioral metrics are better. Um, but I know it's not always po possible. Start with the money and work backwards. So you will, you will have a conversion metric. You will have a conversion metric in there at some point, right? Look for leading metrics up the chain. So a leading metric, if you're interested in that philosophy, there's a, a great um, blogger VC that I could recommend to you guys, to you guys, recommend to you guys, uh, called Andrew Chen. He actually. Sorry, I'll give that to you. It's all right, I'm almost finished. He ran the growth team at Uber, and he blogs about this sort of stuff all the time, growth metrics. And he has a strong thesis on upstream metrics and how to identify them. So I'd, I'd recommend checking him out. And then I'd avoid derivatives if you can. So when I worked in FMCG, we had these like mashup numbers that would combine different metrics. And they'd say, all right, this is the most valuable metric that we need to to go for. But the problem with that is they can be manipulated relatively easily, I think. It's my opinion. So if you can, avoid those when, you, when you're building out your metric dashboard or your metrics against your customer journey. I just want to talk briefly about iteration. The, the whole purpose of going through a process like that on a brand or a sub-brand or a business unit or a product or whatever it is, is not to get to a source of truth. It's to find a place from which to work. So it's a guaranteed that there'll be things in a customer journey that you built that are wrong, that can, yeah, can improve, um, that can be enhanced. The idea of a customer journey, as I said, and I said at the start, is to be an actionable sort of framework. So to use it as an actionable framework, you have to build a test and learn methodology around each phase. Um, if you're interested in learning more about test, that, that methodology, um, there's a lot that's been written about that in the uh, lean startup vein. But you can apply it to your customer journey and basically build out experimentation across each of the phases and really interrogate each individual campaign, each individual piece of content, and each individual initiative that's mapped in your customer journey to try and drive an action and build that experimentation and testing framework around those. Guaranteed you'll just find content that's basically worthless and you can cut a lot of it. I guarantee you'll be running campaigns that you probably shouldn't, or you're measuring them in the wrong way. And that's normal, right? All right, so that's everything I have for tonight. As I mentioned before I go into questions, there's a lot more detail in that workbook around uh, how to run these sessions, um, where to get help, additional information. Uh, the workbook includes, if you don't want to do it as a, as a workshop, but you just want to do it yourself, 
It has sort of worksheets that you can work through um, and a range of other resources. So check that out. As I mentioned, we also run these sessions. Uh, we do it for free. So I'm happy uh, to talk to anyone afterwards if you'd like to come and explore that a bit more. We can adapt it to your business. We can do it for one brand, a sub-brand, a new product, whatever it is you're interested in doing. And then we can give you a sense of how our software supports that as a starting place for the broader work that we all do as marketers. Um, all right, is, are there any questions? The question was, do I have any advice for how to map multiple products across the customer journey? What product category do you work in? Finance. Finance, OK. So the way that we generally structure that is if those products are all targeted at the same customer segment, then you can map those into each stage, provided that there are clear lines of delineation in terms of who's responsible for those products. Right. If it's, so it's, for an airline, for example, it's very easy. There is loyalty, you have your frequent flyer program that comes in at the end. They've got their things, they've got their, the whole suite, that's what they do. Where I've seen it get harder and where it might require its own customer journey um, is where the decision maker for that product is actually outside of the sphere of control of the customer. If you're in finance and it's consumer, it's not as, not as challenging. Um, matriculation, I'd say, is another thing. Uh, if you're trying to matriculate a customer from one product line to the next, so range, you know, range, ex range extension, you've got personal loans and then you get them into a credit card or a uh, home loan, for example, um, then that's a lot easier. But you should probably be targeting, and this is the way I would, I would recommend doing, doing it in a system like ours, is your initiation and awareness building campaigns are mapped to the, say, loyalty phase in one customer journey. But then you also map that campaign to a new customer journey that has other content in it. So basically, you're trying to develop a relationship. If you're uh, developing a relationship that evolves over time related to that product. So it's sort of like a matriculation point into that next thing. It's a bit easier if you're, if you're working with a product where one stops and the next starts. Um, for example, university marketing is very easy to go matriculate from um, undergraduate to postgraduate, where if it's, it's a range definition, it's a bit more challenging. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah? Do you know any resources about really long sales, sort of sales time around 18, 6 months to a year for a big investment? Uh, are there any resources on long sales cycles? Yeah. Um, yeah, there's quite a few. Uh, we have quite a long sales cycle, so I read a lot of those. Um, you just mean blogs and that sort of thing, or you mean specifically around customer journeys? About very long ones. I mean, long ones are very specific, like university. Oh, where the purchase, where, the, um, where it's a big decision. Um, I'd say, because I know that you work at UTS, um, I'd say I can give you some very specific advice about that purchase journey um, as it relates to the different buyer types. Uh, you're probably not going to get like very specific advice at, in like generic things. I thought you meant just sort of like what's a good closing strategy at this phase in the journey. But I can give you specific advice on that um, af after. <laughs> Uh, so the question was, um, you have lots of different audiences or segments, um, and they approach the business from different, different, in different ways. Where, uh, do you combine them into one big one, or do you split them out? Um, you definitely split them out. So the, perp like the, the point of creating a customer journey is that it defines a unique relationship between that segment and, and the company or the product. Um, I would recommend against having just one, if you can, one big customer journey. Um, yeah, so mapping it out, should you have just one really big one or is it individual niche ones? Our opinion um, and what we do for our customers is that you should have individual ones because um, you're trying to direct actionable marketing activities to try, and move, to try and move people along that journey. So that's why we would do it. There may be an argument for doing more broad experience map across your business as well. 
but in the context of like actionable marketing centric customer journeys, uh, we set up our clients for individual journeys. Sometimes on the same brand, it might be all right. So West Track is one of our customers. They're a large B2B company that sells Caterpillar machinery in Australia, about $2 billion in revenue a year. They have different customer journeys for, they've got one brand, but they've got a customer journey for acquisition across uh, four separate customer segments. And they have then a customer journey for retention as well. And retention is like servicing of machines and all that sort of stuff. Um, because they run certain activity, they've got certain properties, they've got certain assets and things that map into that. And they need to measure the efficacy of those things in, in that context, not you know, oh, this social video isn't underperforming that one over there, and say, well, actually, we're targeting this segment, it's harder to buy against them, all that sort of stuff. Yeah? Uh, an iterative brand message, so an example of an iter iterative brand message. So do you mean an example of how you would do it, or just sort of like the process, uh, not the process, like, of how, right. So in my vitamin brand example, I said that my key action at that awareness phase was to get them to um, respect the category of tailored vitamins. So an iteration process on the creative and the channels that I would try to optimize that for um, is testing different executions across channels, or the same, ex sorry, the same execution across channels and measuring the efficacy of, of my desired action in the context of what really matters for that action. So basically saying, if I want to drive search in the category, then my key uh, measurement objective is basically uh, search queries on that, right? Training search queries. What is the most optimal way to do that? In that, in that instance, um, SEM, SEO has a massive uh, competitive advantage. And then there's clear ways you could then optimize, say, creative in that channel to deliver on that, like cost per click, et cetera. And your agencies can definitely do all that for you. Another sort of uh, less cut and dry example might be holistic brand messages at the top of the funnel. What's a way that you can optimize those? Um, generally, when I've seen good iter iterative brand message processes work, it's using a pretty cheap but high reach channel like Facebook, something like that. Talk to your agencies, they'll be able to do this for you. Um, there are specific models around optimizing a mix of messaging across each of, like, like across different uh, content types, different key messages, different supporting CTAs, et cetera, to optimize for the result you're looking for. So that's sort of what I mean by an iterative, creative process on your brand messaging. Um, the caveat to that is I'd say, whatever results you're looking at, you should probably be doing that in tandem with a, a pretty solid interaction with a customer at each phase. Because you might optimize into, say, a really great um, key action based on the metrics you're tracking. When they get into the next phase, uh, they may be cold. They may be you know, crappy. Which means that they haven't actually transitioned using that piece of branded message they haven't transitioned from one phase into the next. Thank you so much for your time this evening. We really appreciate you taking out some time to come and um, you know, spend, hang out with us. And please just come and have a chat if you'd like to learn more.